Okay, I think um, it's a good time to get started with the session. I can see a few more um, participants have uh, joined. So uh, welcome to the AI Club Student Research Symposium. This is the part where uh, we are going to cover some material for teacher professional development. So I have uh, my colleagues, um, Alia and uh, Nisha with me. So um, Alia, do you want to introduce um, the session? Yeah, um, so give me one second. I just want to make sure that you can, uh, give me one second. Sure. Um, can you see my can you see this my um me okay my screen okay so i want to make sure that all of that's visible yes oh, yeah okay uh, so, yes uh, sorry i can stop sharing i think that would be more convenient for you right yes. yeah. yeah and then i'm going to just go ahead and share my screen um and then we'll go ahead and get started so i'm just going to go into presenter mode let me just move this out of the way and then I'm going to hit present. So give me one second. Here we go. So first of all, I just want to say thank you um, for joining us for this professional development today. Uh, I know it's a Sunday and I know that our time is very precious. So I appreciate your time and I appreciate you being here today. So thank you so much on behalf of AI Club. Uh, for spending your Sunday with us. So I'm going to go ahead and get started um, and I'm going to move on to the uh, next slide. So, you know, this is a professional development session and we're going to go ahead and, and, you know, collaborate our ideas together. So as you enter this webinar and whilst we're waiting for other people to join us, if you can go ahead and in the chat box, um, either share a unique application or strategy that you are currently using to enhance learning in your classroom. Uh, briefly tell me you know, what the tool, app or strategy is that you use and why you think it helps um, your students. So I'll go first. Something um, you know, that I've, I've used many years is Flipgrid. Uh, so one of my st students, you know, he does not enjoy speaking in front of a large group of individuals. So rather than asking him to, uh, to present in front of others, this um, student records himself using this app called Flipgrid and then we share that app with the rest of the students and that way he can still participate uh, without the fear uh, of you know presenting in front of others so that's something that I use and I think it's really enhanced um, my students learning because everyone has a voice and every can, everyone can participate so I'll give you a few minutes to answer that um, question in the chat box And that we're going to monitor the chat, just make, making sure that everyone is okay. Give me a second. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Make sure I'm doing this properly. And then Sindhu, I'm just going to ask you to monitor the chat for me. Yes, I think so far we have one response. Okay. Padlet, which uh, helps you to gather uh, to gather ideas quickly. Yes. Perfect. And we're going to use that in a minute. <laughs> okay, so someone said that they've used Padlet before. Um, and I would agree. I'm just making sure that we can see other responses and we'll give you a couple of minutes to collaborate. Yep. We've had one person respond, still waiting for a couple more. Uh, I'm just going to move this over here so you can still see the question. Okay. 
just going to move that down here. I just want to make sure that everyone can see it. Okay. Thank you, RP instructor for responding. Okay, we'll give you another minute or two, and then we'll go ahead and get, get the session started. I'm gonna minimize that. Oh, I don't know what I did. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get the session started. Um, so thank you so much for those people that have responded. Um, any ideas? Are, are yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I think there are two more responses just when you record. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, wait. Oh, okay. Talk and uh, Kahoot quizzes. Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So Kahoot, Padlet, uh, these are all excellent ideas. So thank you so much uh, for sharing those with us. If you're still responding, feel free to uh, respond in the chat, but we'll go ahead and get the session started because I, I, I am um, aware of time constraints. So I'm going to go ahead and run through the uh, objectives for today. So give me a second. I'm going to move this out of the way so we can see it. So the objectives uh, for this session is that, number one, we're going to learn what artificial intelligence is. We're gonna learn how to teach AI at different grade levels. Uh, we're, during this professional development, you'll actually get to complete some of the hands-on exercises that we utilize um, in our classrooms. And you know, I'll tell you about the uh, information that I teach in my own classroom. Um, and at the end, um, we'll offer a PD certificate where you'll just enter your information online and then you can sign up um, and get your P, uh, PGP points for attending this webinar today. So this is the objective uh, for this session. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna see if I can move on. So our trainers today, it's myself and I'll introduce myself. So my name is Aaliyah. I have been teaching and coaching and, men and mentoring both at the middle and high school level. So I am an AI educator. Uh, I've also taught family and consumer science. And um, I am currently teaching a careers class at my middle school. Uh, I am an integrated and wellness coach as well. Um, I, before I started teaching in the US, I actually taught internationally in the UK, where I was, where I, where, where I was the head of department for my subject. And I have developed many units, um, STEM units for Create to Think. I'm now going to introduce uh, Nisha, my other colleague, who will introduce herself to you. So, Nisha, whenever you're ready. So I think uh, Nisha has a small uh, conflict, so I can okay. introduce myself yeah. and I can, yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Sindhu. kind of like talk about her as well. Yeah. So I'm Sindhu. Um, so I um, I went to school to learn how to build machine learning algorithms, and I have experience building quite a few of them. Um, at AI Club, um, I have helped a lot of students build their own AI services for a problem that they care about. And I also develop uh, AI curriculums for them. Um, and I'm passionate about bringing these concepts into a form that they can be understood by uh, young students as well. And at AI Club, uh, we have Nisha, who's um, who has like more than two decades of experience in the computer science industry and building softwares, uh, et cetera. Uh, she has been in the AI for about a decade and she has also helped a lot of students to uh, build these AI services and she teaches middle and high school students um, these AI concepts at AI Club. Yeah. So those, um, you know, are, that's myself, uh, mm -hmm. Nisha and Sindhu, and we will be the main trainers uh, for this session. Sindhu, as I am um, teaching, if there's something that I've missed, uh, please feel free to interject, okay? Sure. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we are gonna do a Padlet activity and some of you are, you know, you know how this works. 
because uh, I, I enjoy teacher engagement. Um, so I'm going to put this Padlet link in the chat box. And the question is asking me, what is artificial intelligence? So let me go ahead and see if I can put this link in the chat box for you. Okay. So I'm going to share this with you. Copy link. And I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat. If I can figure this out. Uh, what am I doing incorrectly? Let's have a look. Give me one second. I'm trying to figure this out here. More oh, chat. Here we go. Oh, I'm just seeing if I can figure out how to put the link in here. Here we go. So I'm just going to paste this link into the chat. So if you go ahead and click on this link, it should take you to this Padlet here. Um, and then the question's asking, why do computers exist? What is artificial intelligence? And why is it important for our children and our students um, to you know, know AI? So whenever you're ready, if you can go ahead, there should be a pink plus at the bottom. If you click on the pink plus, it should let you go ahead and answer this question. I'm gonna keep refreshing my screen um, so I can keep an eye on your responses. So why do computers exist? What is AI? And uh, why do you think our students should know how to utilize, utilize this technology? And then I'm gonna go back to the Padlet so I can monitor your responses. So give me a second and I'm going to see if I can log in. I apologize if I have. Um, here we go. So we've had someone who has said that computers exist to make compute computations easier. Yep, I would agree. AI is an attempt to have computers think like humans, uh, to automate mundane and repetitive things. So you guys are coming up with some fantastic ideas here. I'm going to give you some time to answer this question. Yep, thank you. Yep, excellent. You guys are coming out with the fantastic ideas here. Mm -hmm. And we'll give you a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And as I'm teaching, if I'm going too quickly, please just in the chat tell me to slow down and then we'll make sure we do that for you. <coughs> Give me a second. I'll give you another minute or two um, and then we'll get started. Mm -hmm. Interesting responses. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get off this Padlet. Thank you so much for sharing those um, really interesting responses. I'm going to go back to the um, teaching session. So one of the first areas that we cover when we teach this to our students is we look at what is artificial intelligence and we break that down at both the elementary, middle and high school level. At the elementary, we just kind of discover the basics and that the high school level, we take a deeper look at this. Um, so, you know, we tell the students, uh, you know, AI, comu computer pro programming, is just a program which can perform a task that needs intelligence, such as planning, learning, problem solving, et cetera. It's very similar to the human brain. When I teach this personally, you know, I've taught middle school, elementary and high school. I ask them and they look at me, you know, if they know of the game Pac-Man. And most of them don't. And uh, you know, we just uh, then I talk about Pac-Man. And essentially, Pac-Man is just a game that takes place in a maze. The player controls the Pac-Man, who needs to eat all the dots, 
and the four ghosts have their own personality controlled by the, by the central AI system. So when I'm teaching this to my students, you know, I talk to them about interacting with games. And I know in England currently we have uh, a big football and soccer competition going on. So I bring current events into play. And then I ask them, you know, has anyone ever played FIFA, which is the football game? And um, you know, most of my students raise their hand because they have. And then we talk about how AI is used in that game or in the gaming industry. So for example, essentially with FIFA, when you play that game, the, uh, the, um, op uh, the opposing team is controlled by the AI. And in the elementary school, we just kind of look at what that looks like. And in the high school level, we dig deeper. Uh, I've also used quick draw myself. And this is where the AI has to guess what you're drawing. And very similar to Pictionary. Um, so, you know, we talk about interacting with these different AIs in our everyday life and the students not realizing that that's what AI is. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next session. So give me a second. Um, so our agenda for today is we're going to look at what is AI. We're going to look at why should kids learn AI. We have some introductory exercises that we've done at, using AI Club. We'll also talk about how we match grade level concepts, both at the elementary, middle and high school. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of share some custom projects that the kiddos have done uh, using AI Club technology. Uh, we'll provide you with some free resources that you can take away uh, from today's session. So if you wanted to implement this in your classrooms today, you could. Um, and at the end, we'll also give you the link to sign up for, uh, for the uh, PD certification. Um, so that's our agenda for today. Um, so here are some examples where our children interact with AI without realizing. Um, so our students interact with AIs every day without knowing it. You know, AIs help them understand the world around them. I'll you know, use my daughter as an example. Uh, I have a three-year-old and I'm amazed by what she can do. So she'll say to me, or she'll say to Alexa, Alexa, play bubble guppies. Uh, or Alexa, you know, play uh, Pink Alicious. And she doesn't realize that she's interacting with AI technology. So it's really important that our kids learn how to use this technology effectively. Um, Sindhu, anything else that you think I'm missing there? No, I think these are some really good examples of even kids as young as three years old interacting and a digital assistant is definitely one of them, which is there everywhere. I know, without them realizing. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a Padlet and I don't know what I've done with it. I think I deleted it by mistake. Um, so learning AI helps our kiddos and you know they interact with it every day. Other examples that I share when I'm teaching this I actually get the kiddos to come up with some examples that they, they've used and how they've used AI technology in their everyday lives. Uh, I know that I'm not the best navigator. So, you know, I tell them how Google Maps is an example of artificial intelligence. That machine algorithm, you know, remembers the edges of buildings. It's taught to understand and identify traffic signs, etc. And that's another example of AI that we use without realizing. Um, I recently, I, you know, I traveled back to the UK and I was able to, I signed up for face detection services and I was able to pass border control really quickly and it just used my face detection as, as like an entry path to crossing the border. Uh, the other example I give my students is I use autocorrect. It's really frustrating because with my accent, but I tell them that autocorrect is another example of, you know, AI intelligence. Um, autocorrect, linguists and computer sciences work together to teach machines grammar, similar to us, machine, you know, us teaching younger kids grammar. And then we look at how at the you know, upper uh, school level, how is this data organized? Um, I also give examples where you know, I tell the kiddos, when was the last time that you watched Netflix or Hulu? What happens when you're done watching? automatically it's going to recommend other products or similar products and then we dissect you know how does it know what you're interested in and then we look deeper into the technology that's involved with that 
So that's some of the, um, the things that we do at AI Club. Um, Cindy, anything else I'm missing there? No, I think you covered it really well. Yeah, those are some really good examples. So the main question, and you know, this is something that we should all ask ourselves, is why should our kids learn AI? Why should your children learn AI? And you know, the first and most important point is it's all around them. Second is ethics and AI privacy. And you know, we with my daughter, you know, she's really young. But privacy is really important as an yeah, as a parent, and uh, you know we just uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, especially at the high school level, we dig deeper into the ethical components. Um, and the question I always ask myself is: We have all this amazing technology surrounding our children, but do they really know how to use it effectively? Uh, we know what this technology is, but do they know? when they should use it and how to navigate it. And I think those are some of the questions, the deeper questions uh, that we discuss um, when we teach these sessions to our children. And the final thing that I want to add is why else is it important? The jobs that our children are going to have, they probably don't exist yet. So I think the more we can expose our kiddos to this technology, the better off they're going to be. We want all our kids to be successful. Um, so in my opinion, both as a parent and as an educator, um, I think our kids are surrounded by this. We really need to expose them and we need to educate them. So I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit about AI Club. So I know that AI Club, uh, they have over 3,000 students from grades 3 to grades, uh, grade 12. Uh, with some kids, um, even they even teach kids from grades one to two. Kids can learn AI at different levels, depending on how much math and coding that they have learned. So for example, me as an educator, now I've been teaching with AI Club for the past year, and my background is not artificial intel intelligence. Uh, you know, I'm a family consumer science teacher. I've also taught some STEM this year as well. Um, but it's the way AI Club teaches it, it's really simplified. And those kiddos that have a high understanding of math and coding, and uh, then we dig deeper into those topics. Uh, we have over 3,000 users. Uh, the kiddos have made their own apps. And from my experience when I've taught it, one thing that I really like is we identify problems in the community, then they come up with their own solutions. Uh, Sindhu, anything else that you would like to add there? Yeah, so I think um, you pretty much uh, covered it. Um, the only thing I would like to say is, depending on what the level of kids is, because we have, for example, in our experience, seen first graders who can code. We have also seen like someone in eighth grade who's not familiar with coding. And both of these are okay. So in order to learn about AI, you don't have to know coding. You can learn the concepts, understand how it works and interact with it if you don't know how to code at all. And if you know coding, then AI Club makes it possible for you to peek behind the scenes and look at the code of exactly how everything was built. So there is a nice mapping for grade levels and for uh, different coding levels. And when we kind of do some of the hands-on exercises, you'll see how you can match different um, uh, coding levels and grade levels with how all of these different concepts are being taught, the depth at which they're being taught, the high level concepts I think everybody can appreciate. And as you learn more math and more coding, we can keep digging deeper depending on kind of, you know, the level of the class that you're teaching. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to kind of tell you how AI literacy works. I just want to make sure I haven't missed anything here. Um, so when we're, when we're discussing AI literacy with our children, uh, you know, we discuss the basic knowledge of it, artificial intelligence. We talk about how it works, what it can and cannot do, how to use it effect, effectively, and how to create new things with it. And I'm going to talk to you about my experience. So when I taught this, uh, for AI Club and in my own classroom. One thing that I know works effectively in my 
in my own classroom is a project-based learning approach. So think about when you are given a new phone, you don't know how to use that phone. So the best way you can learn how to use that technology is to tinker around with it. And that's how we introduce AI technology to our students. So we call it a hands-on and top-down approach. So the first thing that the kiddos do when they attend any of the teaching sessions is that they interact with the technology. And I feel like if they are given the choice to tinker around, they're probably gonna be more engaged and more interested in what they're learning. Um, so that's how we start every session is that they are given the opportunity to tinker and problem solve and learn from their mistakes. Once they've kind of uh, ex experimented with the uh, technology, then we encourage them to um, think of a pro real world problem that they're interested in. So for example, when I taught this this year to elementary school uh, students, and we discussed how, you know, the COVID pandemic and how we could use the AI technology that the AI club pr provides in, in detecting mood, especially for the elderly and vulnerable. And especially during the pandemic, they could not get out. Um, you know, this, sometimes that can be very isolating. And we, they were charged to come up with sentences uh, in Navigator. And then that app would then predict whether that uh, a person was feeling happy or sad. And then the student that was you know, working with this technology, you know, looked at how we could use this and take this a step further. So you know, rather, apart from entering, entering sentences, one way that we could improve this technology is maybe recommending resources that individuals could utilize uh, to help them during the pandemic. Um, so when I'm when we're teaching this to our our students, uh, they come with, up with a problem that they are interested in, and I I believe that giving them the choice allows for deeper thinking. So when we're teaching, we don't say to them, "This is what you have to do." We actually give them opportunities to explore something that they're interested in. Because I feel like if they can explore an area that they're interested in, there's probably going to be deeper engagement. Uh, when we're also uh, doing this, they learn concepts. Um, so we discussed how did this AI actually work? What did it get correct? Are there any areas that it did not perform as well as it could have? At the high school level, we dig deeper and then we look at what can we do to improve this technology? So I think that at the elementary, we just get used to using the technology. At the middle, we look at you know, what was accurate, what was not. And at the high school, we take it a step further and we try and retrain the AI to make it better. Um, when we're teaching this uh, at AI Club, uh, we try and always use real life examples. So I think if we can come, if we can use real life examples, that tends to stick with our children. And at the end, once, you know, we use the technology, the students are charged to come up with their own project. So at the elementary, when I was teaching this, you know, I had some students who were really interested in different types of animals. And, you know, they had to research the animal that they were interested in. I had a, one student who was interested in jaguars and he created an AI where you could enter information on that animal and it would tell you whether that was the correct animal or not. Um, anything else there, Sindhu, that you think I've missed? No, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so those are some examples. And then here, I know I've talked a lot. I think, you know, you can now hear from actual students that have used this technology. We have two examples here. Um, so we have example one. This is from an elementary student. And we have many more examples uh, on the AI Club website. And this student, which I'm very proud of, um, is interested in coming up with an AI, uh, which looks at Harry Potter and in what house uh, you would be allocated to, you know, whether that's Gryffindor or Slytherin. Um, the bottom um, student, Sharia here, you know, her problem that she wanted to solve was breast cancer detection. So you can see that AI here at the elementary is just like a fun project, something that the students are interested in, kind of get them thinking. And then here, uh, this student here, we take it a step 
further. So she's identified a real world problem that she would like to solve with her technology. So we're gonna go ahead and play both those clips so you can see the differences uh, between the two students. So let me see if I can get that going. Um, Sindhu, can I get you yeah. to, is that okay? Should I stop sharing my screen? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, and then I'm gonna let you go ahead and play that. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yep, we can. Hello, everyone. I'm Johnny, and I made my project to see what house you would be in if you went to the Hogwarts house of Witchcraft and Wizardry in the Harry Potter series. So my project, it says what house you're in depending on three inputs that you give it. Your traits, so whether you're kind, whether you're evil, whether you're short, tall, your favorite animal, because during the series, there are many animals that one house specifically favored over another, and your favorite color, because in the books, it showed how one certain house was given a certain color in the house color. So I had 100% accuracy, as you can see over here, at 100% in the naval classifier, then force classifier, and the MLP classifier. In the confusion matrix, it's all balanced out. They're all in the teams, and so my data set, it wasn't too biased to one house or another. Um, if you want to test it out, then click there. So you can put in a trait of yourself, if any of you parents want to try it. Yeah, but they don't want to try it. Okay, critical thinking. Critical, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite animal? Lion. And your color? It's Thanks. spaced out of this, yeah. And Gryffindor. Yay. Good, Good job. job. Thank you, Johnny. Good job. That was our first student. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see, when we're teaching this, the students are encouraged to use the technology um, with regards to a topic that they're interested in. But apart from using the technology at the elementary level, we're also encouraged to look at the data and analyze the data. So how accurate was this? And what would be some of the reasons that they may be biased in the data? And at the middle school level, we discussed that in, in much further depth. So we're now going to go ahead and play the second example for you. My name is Shia, and I'm in seventh grade. And my project is breast cancer detection using an AI service. So I was trying to study how advances in computer science can help with early detection of breast cancer. Here's my procedure. I collected histopathology images from CAP. I then used a free tool called Navigator available at the AI Club website to upload these images and create a deep neural network for the classification of cancer in benign or healthy images. After that, I tried several hyperparameters of the deep neural network to tune it for high performance. By doing this, I was able to get accuracies ranging from 70 to 95%. I took a look at the confusion matrix of the classifier. And the goal was to reduce the false negatives because you don't want to miss even a single person having cancer. In addition to using the confidence values output by the AI service, I also plotted something called the ROC curve which is a very popular and highly used metric for analyzing this kind of binary classification. I used it right over here. So by analyzing the data and working on it for several weeks, I learned that it is very hard to tune a deep neural network, especially when two categories are hard to tell apart, such as cancer and benign. Getting high performing AI services with even the latest and greatest tools today takes a lot of time. 
I also learned about so many different types of data for cancer and how an AI service trained on one type cannot be used for another. I learned that having a huge amount of data always helps AI service to perform better as well. So what would I like to do with this information? First, I would like to make it available for the public to get feedback. And second, I would like to make it available to some physicians to get their feedback as well. So those are just some examples of how we've used AI technology, both at the elementary and middle school level. Obviously, we have lots of other examples on the AI Club website. We'll point those resources to you uh, once we get started. As you can see from both those students, uh, something that we really enc encourage is a problem-based approach. So they identify the problem, you know, they're charged to think like computer scientists, then they look at the data, um, they identify a solution to the problem, and once they've identified the solution, we look at, okay, why was it effective, and what could we do better? And the, that's the approach that we take at AI Club, is it's a problem-based approach, where we have a problem, we come up with a solution, and then we look at um, how we can make it better, just similar to like a computer scientist. So those are just two examples there. Um, I just want to make sure you can share my, can you see my screen? Just want to make sure I'm, yep, good. Um, so our next part of the PD is we have some introductory exercises that we would like for you to partake in. So you can kind of see some of the uh, cool things that we're doing with our kiddos. Uh, we're also going to talk to you briefly about how we match content to grade level concepts. We'll show you a couple of projects that the kiddos have done and then we'll provide you with a free resource overview that you can use in your classrooms um, today. So the first thing that we're, uh, we're gonna do is, and we do this at the elementary school level, and we obviously we can tailor that for middle and high school level as well. So something that we ask the kiddos to do is, hey, uh, put your hands up if you enjoy drawing or if you, you, know, if you like being creative. And most of the kiddos, will, you know, they don't like sitting still. Most of them like to be creative. And that's where we use artificial intelligence and art and then marry that together. And we look at the concept of deep fakes. And I ask the kiddos, I'm a lot older than them. They probably don't know this. I'm, you know, I say to them, hey, do you know, have you heard of Facebook or Snapchat? Uh, middle school level, they have. And then I, you know, I ask them the question, have you seen Mark Zuckerberg brag on about having control of millions of people's data? Or Jon Snow, high school, maybe college students, um, you know, apologizing for the admit, dismiss, the horrifying ending of Game of Thrones. And those are all deep fakes. So, so deep fakes are just 21st century issues that involve photoshopping and it's artificial intelligence in practice. Um, so in a second, we're gonna look at how we can marry art and music together. We look at why it's good, why it's bad, and then where deep fakes come from. Sindhu, I don't know if you wanna take this away from me. Yeah, sure, thank you. So I'm going to post a link for everyone. Everybody can try this hands-on, it's super simple. The kids usually have a lot of fun doing this. So this is just a starter exercise kind of before we introduce the actual AI that's being used behind the scenes. So I have posted the link for all the attendees and panelists. Mm -hmm. Please click on the link. When you click on it, you should see something like this. Something that looks like this. And in a minute, I'm going to explain um, how to use it, what this is about, what's the AI behind it, and things like that. And then if you have any questions, if you just post them in the chat, and as Sindhu is doing this, I'll see if I can monitor the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're seeing here is two pictures. So this is the base picture and this one is the style picture. And the idea is we want to combine these two. So I want this picture as if it was created using whatever style this picture follows. So when we, like in our experience, when we have given it to kids, some of, sometimes like they upload their own images and they want to style it with maybe their face or their 
you know, uh, favorite teddy bear or some Pokemon character and things like that. So they're very creative. You can do all of those things, but just as a first step, I'm not going to like do any of that. I'll just simply click on combine. So when you click on combine behind the scenes, there is a very sophisticated AI, a deep neural network, which basically looks at this image looks at this other image and combines the style. So here you have basically this image in the style of this one. So that's the default. However, you're not limited to just these two images. You can use anything you want. So when I click on the plus icon, which is right next to my image like this, there are a bunch of options. There is this MIT building, a cute cat and a puppy and flowers and all of these things, but you can also take your own picture. So this will turn on your webcam and you can take a picture of yourself or you can select a file from your computer. So this is what one of our students did. She had this nice um, watercolor painting that she had made herself and she basically uploaded that file from her laptop. She took a picture of it, downloaded it into her laptop and uploaded it here. So you can do anything. You can take your own picture, pick one of the default ones or select a picture from file. I'm going to select the MIT building and then the same thing for the style. You can again pick any of these pictures or you can select a picture from a file. So I'm going to select this style and I want to see how this combination looks like. So I simply hit combine and that will combine these two styles. So this is based on adversarial neural networks and we are going to learn a little bit more about them in a second. So now you can see it's basically this image. You can see how the clouds and the sky, all of this has been um, you know, formatted into the color scheme of this and into the style of uh, this picture. So let me take a picture of myself. Something like that. And then I can combine and basically I'm going to have a picture of myself saying hi in this style and I can change this to like all different sorts of styles and see how I look in all different styles. So this is something you can all try as well. So we'll give everyone a little bit of time to kind of try this out. Um, and then we'll talk about how a neural network is able to do this, how the technology has come a long way. And I'm sure like some of you have probably experienced this in Instagram filters, a lot of apps these days, actually, you know, they'll even like kind of superimpose ears and like a small spot on your nose and things like that. So it has become pretty common and it's um, important to be able to learn about how this combination happens or, you know, how, why, when is it good, when is it bad, all sorts of ways that it can be used in and things like that. Ooh, I really like that one. Okay. So it's almost like, you know, some artist has drawn using like a, <laughs> yeah, so I really like this style. And when we're teaching this, I'm just going to piggyback on to Sindhu. Uh, when we're teaching this at AI Club, especially at the higher levels, you know, we encourage like deeper thinking. So we look at, you know, this is fantastic at the elementary and they like, adding those images in, in, in the middle school, at the uh, high school level, we ask them, we charge them to come up with examples of where this would be problematic. And um, so like, for example, deep fakes recently, uh, last year in the UK, um, one of the, the German energy firms paid nearly 200,000 to a Hungarian bank after being phoned by a fraudster who was mimicking the German CEO's voice. So we look at issues of national security and how you know, deep fakes can be a huge problem to society. So that's how we take the learning to the next step. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elia. And we actually have one student, uh, an older student, of course, not elementary, who's working on creating an AI that can detect a fake image from a real one. So those are the kinds of, so the thing is this stuff can be taught at different depths. So for elementary, we can just say that there is a generative adversarial network, which is behind this, which is creating this, it's called style transfer. 
Um, and then we can go deeper into exactly how that works and how you can build AIs either to counter it or to enhance it or to build kind of something similar. So, um, I, uh, Alia, can we show the next uh, video? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is just, you know, a hands-on thing so that you can kind of touch and feel the technology. What I'm going to show next is basically a video. This is by the company NVIDIA that you can see here. NVIDIA is a very popular company in the Silicon Valley, especially everyone knows about it. This one manufactures hardware for some very sophisticated AIs. And the style transfer AI that you just looked at was implemented or used NVIDIA's, you know, GPUs, uh, graphical uh, graphic processing units, very special kind of hardware to train and to learn how to do this kind of style transfer. Now what NVIDIA, so this video is by NVIDIA, it's not by AI Club, they're the ones showing of how they built this amazing uh, model that can do so many different types of style transfers and create synthetic images. Now, one thing to really think about is, is this good or is this bad? It's really good. You can have, you know, um, characters that are completely synthetic, do not exist in animations, in movies and things like that. And on the other hand, it can really be used in a bad way as well to kind of, you know, um, maybe, um, <clears throat> swap someone's head with someone else's who doesn't even exist on earth. So you are never going to be able to find them. So like any technology, this is not specific just to AI. Every technology can be used in a positive or a negative way. And this is more of a human problem than the technology problem because technology by itself is not evil. It's just how you kind of use them. So that was a little bit of a digression. I'm going to get back to the video and it's a very long video. So I'm only going to play two minutes, but you're going to have a link for this video if you're interested in watching the whole thing. The whole thing is actually super interesting. are fake none of them are real people and here you can kind of see some little things which kind of tell you that it might be fake but most of them are so close to reality and what they're showing you here is they're going to combine a and b so this is b this is a so if you combine the style of this person on this person you get this person so kind of like the hands-on exercise we had where we were combining two styles but much, much more sophisticated than that. So here, this person became this person when you combine her style on him. Same thing for every single person, including the kid, right? So now we are going to see how they keep changing source B and you'll get completely different people on this row. <laughs> finer details like the hair, ears, sometimes even earrings, glasses, eyelashes. There's so much detail and they're such high quality images. All of these are fake. These are not real people. 
So we have played about like one minute, 42 seconds of the video. It's six seconds and it's super interesting to watch. They kind of show you a little bit more about how they generate hair, how they introduce noise into each image and how they are able to get all of these different uh, images. So I'm going to stop here, but I'll share the link for this video if you're interested in watching it after the session. The kids usually really enjoy watching this. Uh, I'm going to continue. So I'm going to share my squeak, screen again. So we just did exercise one, which was, um, you know, combining two images to make a new image. Um, and then obviously we explore the technology behind that. Uh, next exercise is something that I've actually used with my own class when I teach this. So I've used this as part of an AI club instructor, but I've also taken this and used it in my own teaching. Now, I teach a careers class and we explore different careers and I know my kiddos so in my in my school and some of them are, are not have not done any coding so this is their first experience with actually using this type of technology so I think it's super important um, so when I taught this and I used an example earlier uh, we looked at uh, a mood detector so in AI club you know, we looked at when would you when would you need to know how someone is feeling? You know, can you give me some real life examples? And some of the kiddos, obviously we said COVID, uh, you know, we looked at, um, you know, maybe mental health issues. So if we have a student who's really struggling with mental health, having access to this technology will be extremely useful. Um, then the students are then given the opportunity to tinker with this technology. Then we look at the data and then we look at, okay, what did it miss? How can we improve it? And at the middle and high school level, they're given the opportunity to retrain and make the AI better. So in a second, we're gonna have the opportunity to interact with some of the basic technology that some of the kiddos use at AI Club. Remember, this is only a couple of minutes, but when we teach this, we go further in depth. So Sindhu, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can take this away. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to post a link again on the um, chat. So that's the link. When you click on it, you should see something like this. So it's a website to aiclub.world. This is where we are going to be building it. Um, and to be able to build it, you would first need to log in. So I click on login. I'm already logged in, so I come here. But if you're not, then this is kind of the screen you're going to get at. You can sign in with Google, no problem. Or you can create a username and a password. So all of those things work. Typically, people just find it easy to click on sign in with Google. So since I already have an account, I'm simply going to log in using my username. If you don't, please feel free to create one or simply sign in with Google. So I'll pause here for a minute to give everyone a chance to um, create an account and log in. If you already have an account, then you're already logged in. So you, you wouldn't have to do this step. I'm just monitoring the chat. If you have any um, issues, just type in the chat and then we'll try and help you. Everyone seems to be okay. We can wait for a minute or two. Uh huh. Sure. So your first clue that you have logged in is that an icon is going to appear in the top right corner. Um, yes, it might ask you for a user type. You can ignore it. It's not, it's an optional thing. You can provide an answer if you're okay with it. Otherwise, just ignore it. It should be okay. Okay. And when you click on that icon that appears over here, the first option you see in the drop down is go to navigator and that's the option we are interested in so if i click on it it's going to take me to a screen that looks like this
So what I did is on my AI club account, I simply clicked on go to navigator. Okay, and that takes me to a screen that looks like this. So we are going to build our first um, AI on this um, interface. And while we are going through it, I'll try to talk a little bit about what uh, depth we go to with different kids, including code, details, and curriculum, and you know details of algorithms and things like that. So the first thing to do is just simply create an AI. For that, please click on this button that says create an AI service. So I'm simply going to click on that and I can give it a name. I'm going to call it happy sad detector. Okay. So I give it a name and simply click on submit. So that kind of started my project or my AI service and it's called happy sad detector. Now, um, note how you don't have to install anything on your machine. You don't have to kind of disclose what configuration you have. You don't have to download any files. So this we have seen is very uh, important and helps especially elementary students and even older kids that you are not mandated, mandated to use any specific kind of operating system. I'm just going to chime, uh, chime in there. And I know that you know, I teach in a public school and having that, you know, I have a class, for example, of 30 kiddos. And this just makes it a lot easier where they're not downloading, you know, we don't have issues with technology. And I feel like they're more successful and less frustrated when it's streamlined and it's smooth. And I've, you know, from personal experience, and uh, not having to go through back channels just makes it a lot easier. Thank you, Elia. So all of this, the reason um, we are able to do this is it's all on the cloud. So you don't have to have anything locally on your computer. Everything is in the cloud. Just like, for example, your pictures, et cetera, you can you know, have it on the cloud and access them whenever you want. That's how these AIs are. They're, they're going to be there always. You can access them whenever you want using a browser. So as long as you have internet and a Chrome browser, you're all set. You don't need anything else. Now, everybody's accounts come with these preloaded data sets. And the simple storage service option that we are seeing here, think about it like a bunch of folders that are made available to you on the cloud by Amazon. So there are two folders by default already in your account. And the first one, AI Cloud uh, data sets, is where all the pre-stored data sets are. Now, there are a lot of data sets that are already preloaded into all uh, accounts. We are going to focus on one of them. So each one is for a different lesson plan, kind of. So today we are going to focus on Mood Project 3.csv. So I'm going to just pause here for a little bit because I know you need to scroll down a bit and there are like so many of them. So I'm going to pause here for everyone to be able to select Mood underscore project underscore 3.csv. It's in um, alphabetical order. That makes it easier. Yeah. You know your alphabet, you're good. <laughs> so when you select Mood Project 3.csv, you'll see that there is a small preview of just 10 examples. This data set has about 300 examples, but only the top 10 are shown here. This data set was actually created by high school students who entered into a form or a sheet their ideas of what a happy feeling and a sad feeling is. So that's how this data set was created. This just gives you a small peek um, into it. Um, you see an orange button that says import data set. Please go ahead and click on it. What this does is it tells uh, Navigator that this is the data set we intend to use to train our AI, to make our AI learn something. Now note that there are two columns in the data set feeling and sentence. The idea is AI is going to predict the feeling when you enter a sentence. And we haven't told that to the AI yet, but basically whatever you want the AI to predict is called the label. 
and the label here is the column feeling. So this is what we want our AI to predict. And there are lots of examples of these two emotions. So this data set only has two emotions, but an AI is not limited to two. You can have any number of emotions. This as a starter data set has only two. And there are lots of examples. So for example, for sad, that is I'm sad. I don't feel great today. I miss my friend. I want to go home. So these are all examples of the sad feeling. And there are about 100 or 150 examples like that for both of these categories. So what have we done so far? We have simply told the AI that we want to use this data set. And that's all we have done so far. The next step is called feature engineering, which is the tab right next to data sets. Here, we are going to tell the AI what we are expecting it to learn. So what would you like to predict? I would like to predict the feeling, right? Of happy or sad. So I just say that that's the column that I want to predict and click on apply. So when you click on apply here, a lot of things are happening in the background. So AIs can process things like images, videos, music. It can process um, audio signals. It can process text and all sorts of things. But behind the scenes, it always converts everything into numbers. So all the text here is also behind the scenes being all converted to numbers because an AI algorithm only understands numbers. So that's the process that happened here. So now we have this bunch of data. It knows what it needs to predict, and it has converted everything into numbers. And now it is ready to learn. So the next step is train, where um, so here again, depending on what grade level they are, what algorithms they have already learned, what material has been covered, we might select any of these options. There are a lot of combinations here. But for someone who's building it for the first time, we don't do that. We simply go ahead and click on train. But if you are a high school student uh, who, who's already learning about all the different algorithms, its parameters, how to tune it and everything, you can uh, select some of these options and tune them. Now, let's say you are awesome at Python coding. You already know a lot of Python coding and you don't like this UI interface, you want to actually look at the code that is behind it. It's absolutely possible to do that. So this tool is completely transparent. Whatever is happening inside, you can look at the code behind it. You simply click on generate code button and the entire code that executed this whole thing, you can download it and you can run it, you can tinker with it, you can do whatever uh, modifications you want to do to it, etc. So that is for someone who's very, irrespective of grade level, like how familiar you are with Python coding. And of course, we have Python curriculums as well that will help you to get to a state that you can understand everything going on for being able to build an AI. However, we are not doing that today. I'm not going to generate code or show any code. So we have built the AI. And now you can see it has actually launched several different algorithms and deployed the ones that it thought is the best. Now, deployment is a very unique thing, which I personally uh, find it hard anywhere else. So deployment means that this AI is now available over the internet. As long as you have internet, you should be able to access this AI and kind of play with it. So now we are going to go to the monitor screen and interact with this AI. So please click on monitor. And here you can enter any sentence and the AI is going to predict how you're feeling. So I'm going to say, I'm sad. So I would encourage everyone to kind of try out uh, different things. This was an obvious one. So I'm going to say, I'm happy. Hopefully that says happy, okay. <laughs> um, I'm feeling joy or something, something like that. Let's see what it thinks. So, so far it did well on all of them. So I'm going to try a bunch more and try to find examples where it doesn't do all that well. And if you find some examples where it is making predictions that are incorrect, please post them in the chat. So something that we encourage uh, my students is, you know, we start with basic sentences um, mm -hmm. and then our goal is to try and see if we can um, uh, trick the AI into predicting incorrectly. That's where maybe we'll enter exclamations or we'll enter, you know, we'll change the structure of the sentence. We'll see if the AI can actually predict correctly or not. 
then we look at reasons why there may be discrepancies. So especially with the uh, middle school students, where we can have those deeper discussions, uh, you know, we deliberately enter sentences that may not make sense and see if we can trick the AI into making those discrepancies. So if you have, um, yep. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So there was a question on the chat. Does this work only with English? Well, the AI we just built works only in uh, English, but if you have a data set which is in German or Spanish or French, you know, any language, um, then it will work with that. You just need to provide it examples in the language that you would like it to predict. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, is the data set available in other languages? So this data set we collected from high school students in the California area of USA. So that's the reason it's all in English. Um, so this data set itself is not available in another language, but there are a lot of public data sets. Um, there's Kaggle, which is a huge data set repository, where I'm sure you can find um, sentences in other languages and do exactly the same thing to be able to train with it. And then the other thing that we discuss, I know when I've taught this um, previously, is we actually look at um, AIs in different countries. So you know, I'm from England. And we have lots of lots of different words that I use that are not commonly used here. So we look at, you know, if we were to build an AI in a different country, what that would look like. And I think just having those deeper discussions, you know, across uh, different countries and different cultures, you know, I think students find that really fascinating. And that's where you can tie that in there. So typically the next question uh, that kids ask is, well, it's not, you know, predicting some of these things. They feel so strongly about it. They want to teach the AI because they're like, I'm feeling wonderful is a happy feeling. Why is it predicting sad? So I want to change it or I want to help the AI make the right prediction. So it's absolutely possible to do that. There are so many different ways that you can do it. So the first method we teach them to be able to retrain an AI is to click on this retrain tab. And here, if some, if I say, for example, I am feeling wonderful and I click predict, it's going to say sad, which is incorrect. So I'm going to say this prediction is wrong and I'll select happy because I'm feeling wonderful is a happy feeling. The reason it may not predict properly is because the training set maybe did not have those particular words. Another uh, place is whenever there is a not in the sentence, the AI gets super confused because this is a super simple AI that does not understand the relationship between words. It understands the words individually and it combines the knowledge about them to understand if the sentence overall has a positive feel or a negative feel. So you can predict more and Whenever you're unhappy, you can always say that I'm unhappy with this prediction and change it and give some feedback. So for example, I can say, I'm crying, tears, something like that. Uh, it says sad, okay. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to get it to predict something wrong. Oh, yay, okay. So this prediction is wrong. So I'm gonna again change it to happy and submit. So I just did two, like, because in the interest of time, we have about like 20 minutes. So I'm going to hit retrain. So you can do it as much as you want, depending on how much time you have. And then when you retrain the AI, the AI is going to take all of this feedback and it's going to retrain its mind based on this new data. So now if I click on predict, for example, it's going to hopefully say happy. The first prediction usually can take a little bit of time, but after that it's good. So I can use the other example, like wonderful, for example. Okay, I can't type right. And it says happy again. So it flipped its prediction. So you are able to retrain your AI uh, based on what your ideas of happy or sad are. Now for a little more advanced students, I can say, for example, I'm frustrated. And that's neither like happy or sad, it's a frustration, right? So you can add a category, input a different category. I want to add the emotion of frustrated. 
to my data set. So you can absolutely do that. So you can add categories, you can add more data, you can give feedback to the AI and improve it. And this is only one of the many ways that you can tune your AI, tweak your AI and help it to learn the way you would want to learn. So um, I think we are going to stop this exercise right here. Hopefully that gave some idea of varying depths at which the same thing can be taught. Okay. We're going to move on to the next exercise. I'm going to just share my screen with you. So we've looked at um, you know, how we've used AI, um, how our kids interact with AI. And as we said, this is just a small snapshot. There's a lot more that we do with this when we actually teach the content. The other activity that we look at is, you know, we look at self-driving cars. Um, so when I start teaching this unit, I ask the the kiddos, you know, our children, who's been in a self-driving car. I'm here in Indiana, where it's very rural. So most of the kiddos have not been in a self-driving car. But if I was to teach this, I'm sure in a different state, um, you know, for example, California, I'm sure some of the kiddos have been exposed to that. Um, and we look at what, what is a self-driving car. So at the elementary, we just kind of discuss- You're introducing how- Sorry. Oh, that's okay. That was we just kind of discuss surface level questions like what are self-driving cars and um, why do you think they're useful uh, at the middle school level we kind of start exploring some of the technology at the high school level we take a further depth and then we actually look at the ethics behind this and we look at some of the statistics related to this and something that i share with them is that you know what are the pluses of self-driving cars so you know for example in 2017 the department of Trans transportation highlighted that there were estimated 37,150 accidents as a result of driver error and you know i pose the question if we had self-driving cars and if they were available to everyone that number will be a lot less and isn't it our duty to have those available for every individual so we look at the ethics and we actually have really deep discussions at the middle and high school level of the pluses but also the negatives of self-driving cars um you know human error and um, driver error and we also look at the technology so how do they work how many AIs are combined to solve this problem? Um, and I know at the high school level, they actually look at the technology and, I'm, and Sindhu's gonna share a video with you, which looks at that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I missed anything there, Sindhu. No, uh, perfect. Yeah, it, it, all good, Alia. So um, maybe you need to stop sharing. I'm gonna stop sharing. Here we go. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is an example of how a self-driving car looks and then we are going to have a hands-on exercise where you can build a image detector of your own. We are introducing how the Tesla autopilot works. We are right now on the freeway and as you can see the autopilot is not yet turned on. You can also see that the car is tracking the path that it needs to go in terms of direction. It is able to see the cars in front of it and the cars near it. Now we are going to start turning on the autopilot. Now the autopilot is on. The car is actually driving on its own. How can we tell that the autopilot is on? You see that little blue Tesla sign on the top right, two steps away from the speed indicator. It has now turned blue, which means that the autopilot is on. Note that even though the Tesla is an autopilot, it requires that you keep your hand on the wheel. Let's see what happens if you take your hand off the wheel. Let's see how long it will let you drive without the driver having the hand on the wheel. It's now asking you to apply some force on the steering wheel. You can now see that it starts to light up in blue. It's starting to get worried that you don't have your hand on the wheel. It's now starting to complain and it will do so until you have put your hand back on the wheel. Now we will put our hand back on the wheel. You can see that it's happy again. This is an introduction to how the autopilot works. 
So note that um, it does not actually um, allow a human to be completely off, even though it is very capable of driving on its own. That's because we have regulations, etc., cetera, um, that kind of prevent the cars from just being completely on their own. So we have several exercises after this, either a object detection or a object classification. So I'm going to again share a link with everyone where we are all going to build an object classification um, AI. So when you click on the link, you should see something like this. And this is, you know, at a very basic level, uh, mm -hmm. but if we were to teach this at the high school, then we definitely go into a lot more depth. But we kind of link this into how self-driving cars work and how does the technology work? We look at what a self-driving car is. So it uses sensors, a camera, radar, and obviously the AI technology there as well. Tindy, I'm going to let you continue. Thank you, Ali. So uh, here in this one, so there are many ways you can upload images, of course, but we do the webcam one because that's the easiest for the students to use. So you can do a lot of things like, you know, mask on, mask off, or, you know, glasses on and off, or, you know, just your hand with different poses and things like that. And the first thing you do is rename the category. So I'm going to say mask on and no mask. Okay, so those are my two categories. So I'm going to first um, do the first category where I turn on the webcam and then I just I can just click on this whole record and I can like move myself, different poses of my face and just click, keep clicking on this. So I have about like, you know, um, 23 samples. So I'm going to stop there and then I'm going to turn on this webcam and I'll have my mask on. And then I'm going to do the same thing, different poses, look this way, that way, uh, about 23 images. They don't have to be exactly equal, but they shouldn't be completely off balance as well. So now we have created a data set in like 30 seconds, and then we will train a model. So click on this uh, train model button, and that starts off the process of training a model. This is going to take about a minute or two. Now, for the more advanced kids, there are a lot of things that you can tune about your model and change how it learns. So those are the things that we don't go into for um, start of, as a starting exercise. But as you learn more about these algorithms, how they work, etc., you will also learn how to kind of control them. This is more of an interactive uh, session where you interact with the AI and then you start learning about it because you want to control it. So feel free to try this exercise with different things. Sometimes people try like thumbs down and thumbs up. I think there was another teacher who tried that and that worked really well. If you have any questions, just enter them in the chat. So Cindy, if we were teaching this at the high school level, um, what could they do to kind of interact deeper with this technology? Yeah, so they could uh, basically use uh, this model or more, more sophisticated uh, models in this. They could also- Mask on. Sorry, I think, uh, let me just, uh, <laughs> uh, let me just, Oh no, I think I flipped the categories here. Sorry, that was my bad. So in mask on, I don't have a mask and in no mask, I actually have a mask. So it's going to predict the opposite. Sorry about that. So for more advanced uh, levels, we would basically let them tune something called hyperparameters that they're going to learn about um, if they are at a, at a higher grade. So uh, the first category is basically when I don't have a mask and here it tells how confident it is. But the moment I like put this thing on, uh, hopefully it should change if it's working correctly. Sometimes it needs additional training sessions to be able to change. I think the last time I tried it changed, so I might need to retrain the model. Sometimes that's needed. 
So I'm just going to retrain it. And as soon as it retrains it, it's again going to kind of uh, reset itself and predict. And sometimes it takes like a couple of trainings for it to get it right. So has anyone else tried this in the background and have some facts to share? And you can see here, um, it has the output. So it'll actually give you a percentage for how accurate it is. And the kiddos like seeing that, um, especially the, um, the ones that are a bit more advanced, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that like numbers, they actually like seeing that percentage. Mm -hmm. So now it seems to be doing a little bit better because I can see the other one also going up and down. There is a small lag, which is causing some issues, I guess. So uh, another question. So what does uh, what is the threshold over 90 percent, 80 percent? So the threshold is 50 percent right now. So uh, since this is a binary classification, it outputs a number between zero and one. And if it's less than 0 0.5, it's one category. If it's more than 0 0.5, it's another category. Is it possible to control that threshold? Yes, you can control that threshold. And that's going to change the prediction quite a bit as well. And it has a voice interface, but of course you can turn that off and try this for different images. The more the images, the better it's accuracy always. So those are like um, some of the things in object uh, classification that you can see. Okay, we're gonna continue because I know we are pressed for time. Mm -hmm. um, so those examples are three of the activities uh, that my, I myself have used as an instructor in my classroom, but also teaching for AI club. Those are just basic surface level. And obviously, as we teach more advanced, uh, then we do more advanced uh, activities and exercises with them. Um, next is we're going to briefly discuss how we match grade level concepts to content. Uh, we'll kind of tell you a little bit about the code that we use. And then finally, the resources that you can take away today if you were to implement this in your classrooms. Uh, so, you know, at the elementary school level, I've taught this myself. And um, what, what we teach is how do all AIs need to learn? We look at the many ways that AIs learn. We also look at the different types of data set, for example, text, images, sound. Um, we look at how AIs are different from us. Uh, we look at how, how AIs are different from robots. And then once they've, we've kind of discussed um, the different types of AIs, what AI is, then the kiddos are charged with coming up with their own custom project. So the example that I gave is, you know, we looked at AIs and then the students were instructed to come up with an animal that they are interested in. And then they were charged to teach other students, their peers about that animal. So one of the students is a dolphin lover. Um, so he researched um, you know, information about dolphins. Then we entered that in the data set and then um, it predicted whether that animal was a dolphin or not. And that's just basic elementary, obviously at the middle and high school, uh, they're, they're charged to think much deeper. So that's one of the examples. At the middle school level, obviously they know a bit, a bit more. Uh, so concepts that we ask is um, we encourage coding if they have some experience with it. Uh, we look at how AIs learn and predict. We also look at the data set and how the data set is measured. Uh, we start introducing the concept of ethical issues. We look at how AIs learn from data. And this is where you know, some of their custom projects come in. Um, when, I was look, when I was teaching this myself, um, you know, some of the projects that the students have done using AI Club is I had one student who was really interested in helping those that were visually impaired. Um, and I know that coming from a different country, you know, coins are really hard. I'm from England. The way the coins are, we have pounds and pennies over here. It's very different. So I know that I would probably use that technology myself. You know, I'm not visually impaired, but this student's technology or AI, the uh, concept that she created was she was going to use that data set and her AI technology would tell you whether that money that you were entering was a coin or whether it was cash. I had another student who was really interested in third world 
issues. And she created a very simple AI where it would respond to disasters and it would determine if you needed assistance or not. So if you were in a natural disaster, such as flooding or an earthquake, you, know, you could enter the data and it would and then tell you whether you needed immediate assistance or not. So those are just some of the examples that the middle schoolers have created um, at high school level. Obviously, we, disc uh, we look at this in much more depth. You know, we, we expect them to have a deeper knowledge of advanced AI metrics and you know, some algebra. And this is where they come up with more advanced projects. And so they look at how to build their own AI, but we also look at how to measure the success of the AI and improve that, that AI so it's much better. We discuss issues by looking at the pros and cons. Uh, we analyze the data. Um, we look at diff different algorithms. Um, we also look at how the software works, and what we can do to improve it. You know, that the, one of the students that we shared the example that was looking at breast cancer, we've had students look at Alzheimer's um, disease. And, you know, we're creating an AI can, that can detect Alzheimer's early. Uh, so the, those are just some of the examples that the students um, have used AI club technology to come up with those wonderful projects. Um, Sindhu, am I missing anything? Anything you want to add there? No, I think that was good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and here, those that are interested, we have lots of resources uh, where, and apps that we can share with you. Um, so we look at Python, Java, uh, JavaScript, Swift. Uh, this is a great way to introduce coding to our students. Um, and we typically use this in seventh grade and above. Cindy, I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk to them about that. Yeah, so um, sometimes, like I said, different students will have different uh, coding level or experience at different grades. It also depends on kind of, you know, where you are uh, from as well. So uh, we typically try to introduce um, code to students who are uh, familiar with it or who are, you know, who are interested in learning about it. And they can create some really cool apps, web applications or phone applications where they create or they solve a problem which is powered by an AI. So we have uh, curriculums for those as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, these are some of the student projects that, are, that our students have created using the AI Club technology. Um, so, you know, we have this simple um, project here, which identifies wind instruments. Uh, we have another project here, which was the mood based project. Uh, we have a stock price predictor. We have a plant disease identifier. So we have uh, projects that stem various interests. And that's one thing that I really like about the, AI, the technology that AI Club offers. Um, we have lots of resources that we will share with you in a second. They are all available on the AI Club website. Um, and then the final uh, thing is just certification sign up. So in a second, we're in the chat, we're going to share with you the link um, for the PGP certification. So if you can make sure that you fill out that Google uh, documentation. And once we have your information, we will email you your PGP points for attending the session today. The other thing that I would like for you to do, I love feedback if possible. Um, so before you end the session today, uh, I know that this will really help Sindhu and myself. Um, in the chat, try and be kind if possible. If you can tell me something that you enjoyed and any improvements that you think we can make for next time, any feedback is greatly appreciated because we want this to be beneficial in your classrooms. Um, so I'm going to type that in here. So before you leave today, just in the chat, what you loved, hopefully you loved it, and any improvements for next time or anything else that you think you would like. Uh, I'm sure that we will send the resources to you if you are interested. And then if you can complete that Google Doc, I will put that in the chat. And then once you're done with those two things, um, we bid you farewell, stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can share that in the chat. Thank you, Julie. There we go.
Thank you. Yeah, so that exercise was um, the mask, no mask exercise is usually a good way to get them stuck. And then I know someone said here that they would like more in depth as they teach coding to high school kiddos. Uh, we'll make sure that, that we get those resources out to you uh, mm -hmm. because we want this to be beneficial for you as well. Mm -hmm. And I think they want Jupyter Notebooks, which is perfect. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Colab. So Colab is also a notebook kind of interface, very popularly used for uh, Python, um, kind of the same thing. So we have a direct, like we can show you how everything that is being done in Navigator can be done in Colab as well. Um, you will have all of the code for it. You can automatically generate different code for different AI. So all of those, things are possible and we can send you more information about that. And then someone was asking that, you know, they would like to see more Python um, and then other yeah. information and we'll make sure that we get that to you because we want this to be useful and where you can implement it in your classroom. So we'll make sure that we have that um, out to you. And mm -hmm. And as soon as you're done with those things, um, then you, know, you, you may depart. So we'll just wait for everyone to finish up. Okay, so um, I think, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. being able to see the code and then tuning it and getting it to a uh, good state, yes, all of those things are possible. You'll not have to struggle with the starting of it. The entire skeleton, all of the basic code will be provided, and then you can keep tweaking it um, for uh, changing its hyperparameters and you know getting to where you want it to get. Um, that's um, definitely possible. We already have curriculums for all of those stuff. So, and I'm going to brag upon Nisha and Sindhu. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I am new to teaching. I'm an, I'm a new AI educator, and the thing that I am going to stress is. If there's something that you're not confident with teaching, I've um, Zoomed and um, I've done a live Google Meet with Nisha where she's actually taught this to my kiddos. So if it's new concepts and you're kind of struggling with teaching it, don't be afraid to reach out. And we can, you know, we can live stream with, with your kiddos and actually help you teach this if, if that's something that you desire. So we have some um, people. Okay, I think we have some more questions. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can answer them individually. Yes, it's amazing. Please post it on the chat because we'll have all of these uh, chat questions again. Uh, mm -hmm. And about squeezing it into six to 10 weeks. So the thing is we have curriculums for much, much more than that, obviously, but in six to 10 weeks, it's how many hours in the week and things like that need to be factored in. All of the material, I think, is a lot. You can pick and choose what are the parts that are most appropriate for your classroom based on, because you know your students the best, you'll be able to decide what is really useful for you and kind of, you know, um, take just those parts of the curriculums. You don't need to take like everything that is uh, being offered. So can definitely, um, we definitely have classes which are, you know, only six weeks long, four weeks long and different things or different sub parts of different things are being taught in. So we have a lot of configurations. So that's something that we can definitely discuss. Like pick and mix. So you just pick and choose um, the areas that you would like to teach. And that's the beauty of this. Yeah. We'll give you a couple more minutes. If we don't get to all of your questions, um, you know, we can, we have your information. Uh, also feel free to email us. Uh, yeah. We can, and we will then go ahead and answer your questions. Um, so I just posted the email ID where you perfect. can send your questions over as well. So uh, we monitor that email ID like um, every like, you know, couple of hours. So we, we should be able to promptly respond to your questions as well. 
So thank you for joining the session. I hope um, you know it was uh, useful. And thank you for joining on a Sunday and spending your valuable time with us. Uh, hopefully, we are going to interact with you again. And you're going to introduce AI in your classrooms and uh, have fun with that material. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, just email us. And then we'll do our best to assist you, regardless of whatever level you teach. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great Sunday. Thank you.